So welcome to our second episode of Ask an Analyst and today we have again uh, Sarah and Fabian. Welcome. Hello. Hello. And today's topic is our job and our daily work. Um, yeah, what, what our work day looks like. And um, that's also one of the first questions from Sebastian. What is it like to work for malware analysis? And what, what do you do at work? So, Sarah, what do you do? Um, well, usually I work part time. So I usually do kind of a mix of things when I have time. So usually I sometimes write signatures. Um, I've also added like malicious URLs. I've written a blog post before. That's about it. And you, Fabian? Well, I'm technically not an analyst. So <laughs> um, my my job looks looks a lot different. Um, mostly because MZ Soft is a very small company, kind of. Um, and our teams are very small compared to, well, much bigger antivirus, uh, uh, antivirus vendors. Um, so my job is a whole lot more diverse, I would say. I mean, I do um, back-end stuff um, like um, setting up feeds, um, all, all the intelligence gathering, sample gathering, stuff like that. Um, I do... Uh, a little bit of analyzing. I, I don't do most of the detections. I usually concentrate on the behavior-based detections because those are um, those those are code-based. Um, I do a ton of uh, normal development work, um, like um, on the scan engine, on the behavior blocker, on the uh, real-time protection and stuff like that. So you're actually and, yeah, actually also a developer. I'm mostly a developer and the analysis part is just on the side in, in my free time. He does so ransomware when he's not doing other things because I make him do it. Yeah, she, she's whipping me. Help, I need help. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm mo primarily a developer. But as I said, we are a very small company, so... Our the roles in our team aren't as clear cut as they are in many other teams. That you only do analysis or that you only do um, development, for example. But it's just just a mix of everything, pretty much, from operations over development to analysis, uh, analysis and stuff like that. Um, then there's also the occasional like press gig, I would say, like giving interviews or or coming up with a blog post trying to teach marketing people how to do malware stuff properly because they have no clue. They are all marketing people. Um, and yeah. You just offended every marketing person that totally watches these videos. Oh, they are, they are used to that. Don't, they are definitely used to that. You can ask every single marketing people or, or, or person out there. Um, about their relationship to developers and, and salespeople and they get insulted by everyone. So oh, I think yeah. it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm probably then more the typical malware analyst. Uh, we have about, uh, Gdata has about 400 people. Um, so we are a little bit bigger than MD Just a little bit. Yeah, we have, well, I mean, we have like 30. <laughs> but so, we yeah. are still very small compared to Kaspersky. Like, like, I mean, Kaspersky has a few hundred malware analysts. We have nine. And um, yeah, well, what do I do? Um, I we have kind of a pool of tickets, and there's a sample attached to every ticket, and uh, they have one one of four or five different priorities. So. If there are several samples of the highest priority, I can choose what sample I like to analyze. So I have a little bit of uh, freedom to choose what I do. And um, yeah, then I take the sample, I analyze it. Uh, is it malicious? Is it pup? Is it clean? Is it junk? And uh, then I, 
if if the sample is not detected, then I write a detection signature, and that's uh, I think the most part of my work. But also uh, sometimes I write blog articles or help with blog articles. Uh, sometimes we talk to journalists and sometimes also to law enforcement. Uh, so German yeah. law, law enforcement. Usually. Yeah, we started that recently with joining the No More Ransom thing. Yeah, like it's it's kind of kind of insane. I'm, I'm I'm not sure how how your experience with law enforcement has been so far. Not much, not much. I just but, got a call once about ransomware, but that's it. Yeah. So so I I I talked to to like a a, a Dutch police officer recently, and it's just and it's just insane how how computer literate some of them are. <laughs> like I had to explain to them what is an IP address and what is a port and what is an ASN and what is voice and what pretty much what is everything. Like I I, I gave them a written report um, about a ransomware server that uh, Sarah and I found in uh, within Tor, like like we de-anonymized it uh, and, and found, we were figured out fancy. there. Yes, and figured out their, their CleanNet IP. And we got back like a list of questions of like 50 questions with the most basic thing you can imagine. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty insane. So there are, there are definitely lots of um deficits on the law enforcement side when it's come uh when it comes to these things it seems yeah uh, something else that we do is um we have on call we have um security response on call so uh it could be in a very bad case that we detect um an important system file and in that case someone would call me in the middle of the night wake me up and say please fix that so um, that's also something I do. Uh, it's um, I have I don't have to do it, so that's by choice. I just earn a bit more money with that. Um, and um, another thing, we also do a little bit of development. We have our own internal tools that we develop that we use on a daily basis. And uh, so every analyst also does a little bit development, but yeah, not the engine. I think that's. I think that's the case for um, a lot of antivirus vendors, though, um, that the analysts do a little bit of development. Um, in, in many cases, it's like just simple automation of, of simple tasks, like simple scripting yeah, in like Python, script. for example. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty common, actually. Yeah, for for, for analysts sense. to do like a little bit of development because I mean they they do this all day long right they know what tools they need and, yeah. uh, um, and it makes what is work helpful a lot for them yeah having like a script to do it some of it for definitely you. yeah we also do sometimes proof of concept codes that the developers then build into the engine so yeah sometimes that's a very good way to to create new things. And, and it's also how a lot of like engine developers or well if, if we want to call them that they often start off as malware analysis and analysts that then slowly transition into engine development because they did a lot of proof of concepts and stuff like that. All right, uh, let's go to the next question from Corey. Uh, what made you get into the industry? That's actually two questions. And if you could do anything else you wanted for a job, what would it be? So what made you get into the industry, Fabian? I think I already mentioned that before, right? Um, in, in the last episode. Yeah, oh, we, like, we kind of covered it last time. But I you, can, you, can, you can answer the second bit, I think. Yeah, yeah just, just right. to quickly re reiterate, I got infected by tequila ages ago. When I was like 10 or 11 or so, and um, I didn't have an AV at hand, so I just took it apart and I just liked doing it, pretty much. So that's how how I got into. Um, if I wouldn't have gotten into it, I, I would have probably finished school and then become a teacher and then just make everyone's life miserable <laughs> because I can't tolerate stupid people. A so, teacher yeah. for which subject? Um, probably, probably maths and probably, uh, 
one of the other sciences, probably physics or chemistry, I think, or maybe maybe philosophy. I think I could be a good philosophy teacher just because I like I talking. I could see you doing that. Yeah. It's kind of interesting, and I think what most people don't know is uh, that I actually learned kindergarten teacher before I uh, studied computer science. So. Oh, you did? <laughs> oh, yes. wow. So uh, I, I really love kids. I love working with children, but uh, I am not capable of doing that for a long time, or let's say on a daily basis, because I'm not multitasking uh, able. So... Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Bit. You totally need that because yeah, every, you every... need to keep attention yeah, you to like, every single kid. Because as soon as you take your eye off one of them, they're gonna get into like some kind of situation. Unless you are like kind of a private nanny, I guess, where you can concentrate on just one kid. And now, even yeah. with one kid, it's exhausting. So I don't know. I don't. I don't have kids. You don't so. have kids. <laughs> you wouldn't know. <laughs> but yeah, if you are an in, if you're an introvert and if you are very much on one let's say not not able to multitask then it's really exhausting to have this kind of job and i have high respect of everyone who who's able to do that so i'd rather switch to computers and that's something i can do better uh and they are easier to understand actually yeah that they're pretty binary you could say yeah and oh, if... that's such a great pun <laughs> <laughs> amazing pun so, uh, Sarah, um, what would you do if you uh, couldn't um, do malware analysis? Well, I do chemistry as part of my A-levels, and I would probably go into, like, synthesizing organic chemistry, like, organic chemistry and synthesizing organic chemicals, because I find that really fascinating. Wow, that she sounds would, interesting. She would essentially, like, build uh, real-life viruses, <laughs> I guess. Oh, drugs, okay. Yeah, yeah, viruses would be more like uh, you go into biology, like chemo. Yeah, I guess. I guess mix of both, probably. Yeah. But yeah, you could make, um, you could combine them and make drugs for like um, certain viruses and bacteria. So yeah. That's pretty cool. Have you ever thought of combining computer science and biology or chemistry? Um, I think that would be cool, but. I'd rather like focus on the analyzing and then maybe if I want to change, go and like study chemistry at like, uni later on. Just to, like expand my knowledge because I think that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Look, that's uh, to answer the question from me. I considered that. I considered combining medicine and computer science or biology and computer science. And uh, when I was doing my bachelor's thesis, I had the opportunity well, I almost did my bachelor's thesis in uh, artificial neural networks and using them for image processing of um, MRI images, so magnetic resonance imaging images. <laughs> and uh, it didn't work out, uh, sadly, because my supervisor got uh, was placed in a different area uh, suddenly, so... I had to choose another topic for my bachelor's thesis, which was a bit sad, but that's something that really interested me, um, a, di a direction I might have pursued if the uh, malware analysis had not worked out. Okay, next question is from Micha. What tools do you use on a daily basis and what tools do you never use and why? Sarah. Um, personally, I use Sublime as like a text editor. That's a really good text editor, by the way. Um, I also use um, a hex editor just for like checking out encrypted files, malware binaries, etc. Um, when I'm doing analyzing, I usually use Process Hacker, um, Wireshark, and like network sniffing tools and then also RegShot is quite useful because it shows you all the changes that like for example um, a pup can make on a system so they're my main tools and you Fabian? well for me it's like a whole bunch of tools like virus total sublime text um, 
010 editor, as an hex editor, um, Ida Pro a lot, like a lot. <laughs> um, Yara. Always has it open. Yeah, I. It's 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 always Ida Pro and Visual Studio, like with a couple of instances. <laughs> um, then the end spy for all the dead nuts, uh, .NET stuff. Lots of Python, Bioshock, VMware, like Rackshot. Then um, Sarah already mentioned um, API Monitor, Process oh, yeah, Hacker. Yeah, that quite. Useful. Yeah. Um, X sixty uh, four debug as a debugger and yeah like a couple of like internal tools that we have um tools i never knew are usually the tools that i simply don't know about which is probably a ton i'm i'm i i don't get around much when it comes to tools i i just stick to to the stuff i i know um i don't think there's like any tool that i would outright refuse to use I mean, if it fits like the, the the purpose, then I will probably use it at one point. It also um, makes sense if some tool doesn't work, we just use another, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, may yeah. I I think I I refuse to use Notepad plus plus because it's an awful text editor, <laughs> and Sublime is just so much better. And yes, I just started an editor war. <sighs> I guess yes. I should. I should try Sublime once because I use uh, Notepad plus <laughs> plus. Does it, it even have really like nice. a Linux port? And uh, no, I I use uh, Windows for that because. Oh, but I mean, Sublime is has Linux port, I think. Yeah, it does. But um, you being like a, a Linux person, at least in 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 um in real life, like in in in, in private life. Yeah. I, I would have expected like. E Emacs or, or Vim or something like on that. On Linux, I use Vim, but uh, uh. for the daily work. Oh no, work, you started another war. <laughs> <laughs> on uh, for the daily work, we have to work on Windows machines, so yeah, I have to use um, something else. So. <laughs> I mean, there is there is Vim on 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 Windows, right? Yeah, of course. So you could could use that. No, no. Try try Sublime. It even has like a a vintage mode, so you can use all your nice Vim skills to do stuff and like that, like all the keyboard hackery. Um, you can use it in Sublime as well, so you don't have to learn like a, a, an another editor. Yeah, the tools I use I are yeah similar to yours. Uh, I also use Ida. I use VMware. Um, HXD, the Nsway, Jara, Portex Analyzer, so um, Sys internals, Wireshark as well, um, and our own internal tools. Oh, I can't, I yeah, same as Fabian. I can't say which tools I never use. It's just there are so many to choose from, and I just can't try all of them. Uh, yeah, and sometimes you have tools you use once or twice in a year. Um, yeah. They are, yeah, some special malware, like, I don't know, like Lisp malware. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Four Octets asks, uh, do you as a professional focus on one family of malware or whatever is put in front of you? I think I answered that question a bit already because I have to analyze everything I get. But since I have some kind of way or some some freedom to choose the samples, um, if, if I get ransomware samples, I usually choose them at first. So yeah, how about you, Sarah? Do you specialize or do you do everything? Um, I don't really specialize in a certain family, but I have written occasional like I think we followed Apocalypse quite Apocalypse ransomware quite um, closely, um, me and Fabian. So that was one such family. But usually, like when I'm just adding signatures, I just work on whatever there is, which is either malware or pubs. Fabian. Well, I am like in a in a little bit more privileged position, I guess. So I can pretty much choose whatever I want to to work on, since like analysis isn't my day to day job. Um, 
I think like if if you're like a normal analyst, then you will pretty much just work on whatever is in front of you. Yeah. Um, but there's almost always like an like almost an, a natural transition to specialize in a certain area. Um, like yeah, you just happen to do ransomware a lot, and then suddenly you become like the ransomware guy in the in the. Yes. Yes. Exactly. In the lab, and they will they will just shuffle all the ransomware into your direction because you 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 are just um, used to dealing with them, and you are just a lot quicker analyzing and taking them apart than the other guys. But yeah, I think um, it's it's important to handle a lot of different malware though um, as an, an um, as an analyst. So you have like a broader spectrum that you can draw from when you have to deal with, especially with like more complicated malware or malware that uses something um, or, or uses techniques that are new and uh, uncommon at the yeah point of time when you, when you analyze it. So yeah, don't try to specialize too, too soon on, or, or too quickly. But... Yeah. It's actually also quite interesting to have uh very wide range of different types of malware but as you said we also have like the the guy for potentially unwanted software we have the guy for scripting malware yeah those are just people that like to do uh, these types of malware or samples more than um, others so they usually do the work but every one of us has to deal with everything if necessary all right um next question is by Corey, um, what is the most frustrating thing about the industry? That's an interesting question, and I think Fabian, you have to, uh, you might have some interesting answers. Well, <laughs> I would say like all the marketing bullshit. It's just uh, marketing people. No, you just hate marketing. Folks. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I. Well, I don't hate them. I just don't know how just, to defeat yeah, them and get, get rid of them. Annoyed by them, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's that. So yeah, for me, it's definitely marketing bullshit. All the, all the next gen stuff. Oh, I just want to strangle them so hard, so so bad, so bad. Like when whenever like a new next gen vendor pops up and says, "Oh yeah, antiviruses. They all use signatures, but we use something else." Then you we just we use behavior blocking or uh, loud. Or, or machine learning and stuff, and y you just... It's not just... like every single, <sighs> well, most antiviruses don't use that already. Yeah, and have been for like the last 15 years or so. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the last pure signature-based scanners were back in, in the DOS age. And even in the DOS age, they already had behavior blockers, right? And that was like 20 or 25 and machine years learning. ago. I think like and... learning from like viruses and stuff. Yeah, I mean, like, like um, Bayes filtering, for example, has been in use for quite some time, and it, I mean, it's 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 not exactly machine learning, like in the in the in the same sense that we use the term nowadays, but it's kind of in in that direction, and I'm pretty sure that even the the current and modern machine learning algorithms has have been in use like for a very very long time. Yeah, that's also my point that I think the wrong understanding about how AVs work is just uh, frustrating because um, it's not only the marketing people, and, but the, I think the marketing people just um, give that knowledge, knowledge uh, give that to everyone else that's false understanding. Yeah. Um, yeah, anything else, Sarah? No, I think it was already covered. Yeah. Um, all right. Big surprise. Uh, all the tech guys hating marketing. Very big surprise <laughs> at this point. Well, I don't hate it. I just... Yeah, but it's... you get annoyed by it, right? Sometimes, yes. Yeah. It's just frustrating. Or all the people that say AVs are useless. And... Okay. Don't run an uh. AV. You're going to get infected by zero-day targeting antivirus. Yeah, which literally never happens, right? I, I think unless there isn't a single you, a single you, documented like, case. Really, I, think. I don't know, kind of 
environment where there's a lot of sensitive data, I don't think you're going to be like targeted by them people. I'm it pretty sure that. Sense. Yeah, but in those cases, in those cases, the systems tend to be very restricted and like sandboxy, like and they you don't run Davy but... anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another question to you, Fabian, uh, by Corey. With all the decryptors you have written, what is the best reaction you have gotten from the malware authors? Oh, that's easy. I have documented it on my Twitter feed. It's it's all the rage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's like particularly funny when they actually make my job easier by raging at me. Like the Radamund guys, for example, they, they got so upset at me for breaking their ransomware over and over again that they wanted to insult me so badly that they stored their insults in some variables that were previously uninitialized. And by doing that, they actually made my decryptor a lot more reliable and a lot a lot quicker yeah, because yeah, I had yeah. like I just honestly you can you can put as many insults at me as as you want into your into your shitty ransomware, <laughs> especially if it makes my job easier because all I had to do oh yeah but now suddenly I know what those variables were so I know exactly if I got the right key and I don't have to do like hacky. Um, format-based detection stuff or something like that. Um, That's funny, yeah. So, yeah. I, I was also uh, once hunting malware on VirusTotal, just uh, searching for cuss words, for bad words. So. Yeah. <laughs> and I found a uh, lot of stuff. Yeah. I think you even set up a signature, so if yes. someone insults you, then you kind of can see it. Yes, I do. It's the I am famous rule. Um, it's like a little Yara rule that looks for several cuss words and mzsoft and my name and stuff like that. <laughs> and it actually finds quite a bit. So yeah, there's that. But yeah, the rage is pretty funny, actually. Um, and I document it on my Twitter feed, so follow me on Twitter. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. How long does it take you to analyze a sample on average, Sarah? Um... Usually, if I'm just doing generic signatures, it will take not that long because I just run the malware, wait for it to make its changes, and then I check what changes it's made, and then just write a signature, which doesn't take that long. So, I guess 5 to 10 minutes per malware sample. Less if it just decides it's going to quit and go crash. Yeah... The amount of buggy malware samples out there is just insane. So many. So many. I'm so often tempted to write a bug report. Yeah, me yes. too. Or we like, need or like, contact information so we can give them a bug report and yeah, like, tell them to fix their shitty ransomware. Include, include your WhatsApp or number or something like that in, in inside the malware binary and we will, we will submit bug, bug reports. I mean, <laughs> like the friendly police person will knock on your door and then deliver it personally, I think. But yeah, that would be awesome. So how long does it take for you, Fabian? I think it's, it, it depends a lot on why you're analyzing that mal malware. I mean, if the purpose is just detection, then it's just a couple of minutes, pretty much, like Sarah already mentioned. Um, if you want to know exactly how it works and or if you want to reverse engineer like protocol details so you can create your own client for botnet to just scan the botnet and map out the botnet and stuff like that, then it will take a lot longer. Um, I do mostly ransomware, as everybody knows probably, so... Um, I I think I know pretty quickly whether or not the ransomware is most likely secure or not. Um, yeah, usually it's like I say half an hour. Yeah, it's usually about the average time. Then getting all the details right, like reversing file name obfuscation or figuring out how the encrypted file format is laid out exactly and stuff like that. That can take like a couple of hours or even days, like depending on how complex the whole thing is. Um, I guess on average it takes probably like around eight hours 
for me to take a part in your ransomware family and then writing a decryptor if it's possible, I would think. Eight hours sounds about right, right? Yeah, I would agree. I also I have a hard time to put a number on that, uh, how long it takes me, because that varies a lot. Even if it's just for signature detection, we also write um, algorithmic detections. So sometimes um, I might have to write a lot of programming code for, for instance, if there's a feature that we need but don't have yet, I um, write functions for that myself. And that might take a few days. So uh, it could be that I have to work a few days on a sample. But the usual case is 10 to 30 minutes, um, including the, the decision if the file is malicious or not. If it's a clean file, it takes longer. I really hate to analyze clean files because they are boring and... I agree. <laughs> yeah. And you have to do... Well, it's hard to prove the absence of of something, so it's hard to prove that the file is clean. Um, yeah. If you have a malware, you can open it up in a hexadata and see immediately, immediately that it is malicious, often. Uh, yeah, in many cases you can. In many, many cases, yeah. So that's then the easier case. Mm. So yeah, uh, security peep asks, how often do you see novel packing techniques? Sarah? Mm, I don't think I've ever seen any, but I haven't been like working on it for too long. But I would say probably it's quite rare generally. And you, Fabian? There are even there are novel packing techniques like that are like ten years old. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's uh, like like all the other packing and obfuscation stuff is kind of kind of really really boring and you have to do it like all the time and it's really annoying because it doesn't really i mean it 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 just slows you down a bit and for for most packing techniques if it doesn't like involve um a compile time obfuscation or something like that or some some virtual machine somewhere then it only takes like a couple of minutes to to get around so yeah no y you don't see it that often i mean i think one of the things that a lot of malware authors don't understand is the more you pack and obfuscate your files, the easier they are to detect. Because, yeah, I mean, not a lot of applications out there that are packed or obfuscated. I mean, there are a few, um, like, uh, DRM systems and stuff like that. But, yeah, the more exotic you get and the more... Um, the more your file kind of sticks out um, from a large crowd of files, the easier you will get detected. Yeah, some vendors even flag certain packers. Oh yeah, all, yeah. A, a lot of them do. I mean, just just take like like morphine and pack any file you want, and you will get dozens of detection. And I mean, it makes sense. I mean, a lot of those packers are exclusively used by 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 ransomware or uh, well not only ransomware but malware in general so i yeah. mean why, why bother adding all the all the actual malware families or even write an unpacker if you can just reliably uh, reliably detect the malware packers yeah but even for the commercial packers like Temida, um some vendors just detect the packer although it's um, used by legitimate software as well Right. Yes and no. Um, the way for uh, the way it works there is that a lot of the commercial software protection tools embed like the license code or like a watermark who who essentially packed this uh, this file. And if you take uh, licenses that have been leaked or that are just in, in distribution because um, of virus or because, uh, yeah, as I said, someone leaked the license, then they um, detect the digital signatures and the watermarks that these specific versions leave behind in the file. I don't think, I mean, I, I, I do have like um, 
uh, Thimidar, if it's if it's pronounced that way, I have no idea. I a Thimidar no license. And I'm pretty sure if I would pack, like, uh, with, with my personal license, uh, notepad, stuff like that, I won't get too many detections. But if, if I would use uh, a pirated version of the MITER or a version that is in circulation within um, malware forums, for example, or hacking forums, I would get it a lot more. And that's based on the little digital watermark that these versions leave behind in the packed files. Yeah. And now the the last set of question is, questions is, I think, the most interesting part, and I saved it for, for the end of our podcast. Um, it's a uh, sexy lady asked, what part of your job do you find the most interesting? And Hesherizade, I'm also not sure how it's pronounced, I'm sorry if it's wrong. Um, what do you like the most in malware, what excites you about this job? And you, Sarah, you added the question, what's the thing you enjoy most about your job? Why do you like analyzing malware? So it's basically, I would say, three questions. What's the most interesting, what's the thing you like the most, and what's the most exciting part um, of your job? Sarah? Um, I think the thing I like the most is being like able to kind of detect a whole bunch of like malware and then seeing that actually like being detected when I go to scan the files myself. So I feel like I'm kind of contributing. Um, um, the exciting part is probably finding new ransomware, um, making sure that we look into it, like seeing if it's interesting, has anything new. And then if it's like decryptable, getting a decryptor made. So that's quite exciting. Um, the most interesting part is probably just learning about malware generally. It's kind of like a puzzle. So you're kind of like trying to figure everything out, certain types of malware. So, yeah. You, Fabian? Mm, I think I just like those little critters. I mean, they are... I like taking them apart, like breaking them if I can. Um, I even like coming up with like new or novel ways of preventing them. And before I got into malware analysis, I even enjoyed just collecting them. And um, yeah, kind of like people collected stamps. I mean, nowadays it's not really feasible for like a single person to have a huge malware collection because we are in the hundreds of terabyte region right now. Well, if, if you were to collect everything. Quite boring as well. Yeah. But like in, in, in the good old DOS days, when there were like a, a handful of viruses, it was pretty fun just collecting them all, like Pokemon. I mean, like a more nerdy and probably shittier version of Pokemon, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, I still collect interesting malware though. Yeah, I, I, I also do. Like, I have, like, my my, my special ransomware collection that yeah. we use for regression testing of our behavior blocker, for example, and stuff like that. And I keep it neat. And, yeah, it's it's awesome if you have OCD or just, just a nerd like I am. Um, so, yeah, so essentially it's all just one huge puzzle to me. And I really, really like puzzles and... Yeah, it's one puzzle with seemingly an endless amount of pieces, so I just like like doing it. Yeah. Uh for me, um what uh it's similar to Sarah that I like the most is the satisfaction of detecting malware. When I write a signature and I get the uh, feedback that it prevented infections for a lot of people, it's just an amazing feeling like oh wow, now this person didn't get infected because of my work. And uh, that's something I really like. Um, exciting part is also for me hunting malware. Like you said, Pokemon, that's exactly what it is. You hunt uh, malware and if you find something new, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite, quite interesting and exciting. Yeah. Um, sometimes seeing um, new languages, uh, programming languages used or new techniques used can be very exciting. Uh, 
and also when I started out, I mean, I started two years ago, so it's not that long ago. I'm still kind of a beginner. Um, if I crack something difficult or something that had been difficult for me, um, I also get this adrenaline rush. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really amazing. Um, what's the most interesting part? Yeah, learning new things, um, getting in touch with new file formats, new languages. Um, yeah, and also the uh, connecting with fellow researchers is, and talking to them about our nerdy stuff is quite amazing. Yeah, connecting so. with people is quite good. <laughs> yeah, and the entire malware analysis part kind of forces you to do that as well, right? I mean, if, yeah. if you're an introvert and you yeah. have like a hard time connecting to people, I mean, at least you have something to talk about. And um, usually... Um, the other side is just as enth enthusiastic and um, knowledgeable about the topic that that you are. So you have like a common base to connect with people. It's it's kind of interesting. Plus, since Maria is so diverse with different types everywhere, you are kind of forced to to learn new stuff all the time, which is kind of interesting if you if you are like like learning and like improving yourself. So. Yes, and asking the experts for help is uh, also something you usually do. If you don't get anywhere, um, if you have a sample that you can't crack, then just ask your colleagues. And yeah. yeah. And no one, or at least I made the experience that no one um, is so arrogant in, in their response or something. They are all very helpful. And uh, yeah, just help out maybe ask you back <laughs> for the things you are the expert in. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's already everything for today. So uh, um it's very, very uh well not sure what to say. It's it's great talking to you. <laughs> and um it's interesting then you have so or that our views of what's interesting and exciting are so similar. Um, yeah, and then next uh, in the next podcast we will be covering the career, how to become an analyst, and how to balance learning and other things. Um, so this will be very interesting uh, topic as well, and I hope to see you soon. Okay. So bye bye. And bye. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for watching. Thanks for having us. Thanks.